We're the Cosmic Psychos from Melbourne, Australia. Here's three ugly looking blokes. You know, two are in the world. Playing in all these wonderful cities. Dying at all these wonderful restaurants, meeting all these famous people. In the back of your head, you're going, I'm thinking to myself, I'm going, well, I'm a fucking farmer. Once I found the Cosmic Psychos, it was kind of like, yeah, these guys are what I've been, what I've been looking for for a while. Live was always so huge and powerful. I guess it would remind me more of like late 70s punk rock. You know, played through a stereo inside of a muffler of a car dragging down the freeway. That's what they sound like. <laughs> I think the Cosmic Psychos were a band that was highly influential on the Seattle so-called grunge scene. They're pretty freaking exotic to, to me, you know, like they're, you know, from a completely different life, different world, and uh, they didn't try to be anything than the, other than the, what they were, you know. Their songs about driving a bulldozer, for me, that was like, wow, okay, I'll see punk rock. You know, that, that's, that's punk rock for me. This is a great band that you could pull for Australia. They're our ambassadors. Have a listen to their lyrics. They sing about dead kangaroos. She's a lost star, she's a lost star. Yeah, well, I suppose I had my upbringing was sort of pretty normal country upbringing, pretty isolated. Around here, born and bred on the farm. Forget to dag around with yourself a lot. Do a bit of shooting, bit of fishing, motorbike riding, driving utes, cars around, tractors. This farm's been in the family for three generations. Well, this, this property was the main homestead for the whole Spring Plain spread, and it was a huge mammoth property. It was also a horse changing station for Cobb Co coaches. They'd come through here and change horses and people would bed down in the house for the night. There was sort of some really rough accommodation in there. And then the Digan brothers, or the Digan family, had this property in the 19, early 1900s and their first plane built and flown in Australia was built in a shed over the back there and they flew it down on the creek flat. So it's a fair bit of history involved in the whole place, but it's just a significant old Victorian homestead, really. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it was a grand old place at one stage and I still reckon it is. I still reckon it is. It's got a lot of good vibes about it. There's a few rattles and squeaks, and you always never feel alone in the place. It's got some history in it, all right. I've certainly added a little bit of modern history to it. That's for sure, in my own funny way. Yeah, it's a bit of a, a bit of a nervous time around here because for the last 12 months, we've gone through a bit of a nasty separation, and I'm stuck living in a shed. The ex-missus is in the house at the moment. A couple of kids involved, and at the end of the day. Uh, the whole farm could go, so it depends on what the settlement's going to be. So it's a bit of a bit of a worrying time at the moment. So uh, whether I can keep the farm or keep part of it, I don't know. So hopefully I'll keep something. If not, I'll just take a truckload of dirt with me, build a sandcastle somewhere. I'll have to wait and see what happens. Music come in pretty early. The little period we spent down at this this town outside of Melbourne, which is called Sunbury, there was a uh, big rock festival there in the 70s and it was full of hippies swimming with no clothes on and lots of loud music and it actually just happened to be at the back of this property that my old man was managing. So there was someone else living on the property at that stage. She was about a 15 year old girl and she used to take me down, lucky me, take me down to this hill and we'd sit there and listen to the bands play because the stage just sort of backed up to the properties. I suppose the band started from a high school punk band. I think we formed that at the Kyneton High School in about 1977, 78, called Rancid Spam. I went by the name of Ray Decay. Steve Morrow, the singer, he was Stephen Danger. And the guitar player was uh, Robbie Addington and he was called Rat Salad. So we formed this punk band, did a couple of gigs at school, did a couple of school socials. Everyone hated us. There's only three punk rockers in Kyneton. We weren't very popular. 
But, uh, you know, at that stage of your life, you're 15, 16, you're depressed, you hate everything. And the punk rock thing come along at the right time for me. Rancid Spam morphed into Spring Plains when Steve and I moved to Melbourne. We roped Peter Jones into playing guitar. And we used to just jam for hours, put the drum machine on and just play for, you know, get pissed and stoned and just jam for hours, you know. Steve would hit, you know, milkshake containers and rattle things and he sang through um, this ghetto blast that to distort his voice. And Steve, who was going to uni, hooked up with one Mr Bill Walsh. Yeah, I remember the first time I met Ross and, uh, you know, we kind of became quite matey and chummy because uh, he sort of offered me half his pack of twisties. And I thought, oh, he seems like a pretty good bloke. He'd be good to play in a band with. So Bill turns up with, I think he had one cymbal and, I don't know, one drum and bugger the ball, he had bugger all else. And we're sort of thinking, oh, great, a drummer. And we're sort of going, well, you do something. And he's going, no, no, you do something, because none of us could play. We never really knew what we were doing. You know, we, it, we had songs, but we never really knew how they went. But yeah, eventually we, we started gigging. So we played some really bad shows. Yeah, we, you know, we were horrible. I, I, I think we were horrible. I left Spring Plains for about six months, seven months, because they wanted to practice and rehearse and record every weekend. I wanted to drink beer and play cricket. And then I joined Spring Plains again, went back with them, changed our name, we went through a heap of lists of names. I liked the dirty Cosmic Psychos. Steve used to be called Cosmic. My nickname right through school and my footy days was Psycho. I had the nickname Dirty at university and they resurrected it much to my annoyance because I didn't really want to be introduced as Dirty. It was a nickname he hated, but of course Ross being Ross, he would just hound him with this name Dirty. So there was no way we could call, you know, what we had after Spring, following Spring Plains could be the Dirty Cosmic Psychos. When Cosmic Psychos, when that was sort of voted on, I just thought it was a stupid name. And then, then again, I changed my mind because Dirty, Peter was sitting at the Esplanade one time and he was talking to a member of Split Ends, I can't remember which one. It wasn't one of the Finn brothers. And there was this conversation apparently going on that, oh yes, I'm in a band, oh yes, I'm in a band, yes, I'm in a band. And anyway, Peter was asked what band he was in. He said, oh, the Cosmic Psychos. And this donkey from Split Ends goes, oh, what a stupid name for a band. It was quite serious. So as soon as I heard that story, I thought, well, We'll run with it now, quite happy with that now. And then we booted Steve Morrow out. I don't even know why we kicked him out. I can't remember. Oh, he was a bit of a Nick Cave clone, I think. And uh, he just wouldn't shut up. We had a rehearsal. We got there early. Steve came and, you know, after 15 minutes of Steve's arrival, Steve's out of the band. We decided to share the vocals, so we quickly wrote down a few words to whichever tune we were going to play. We thought, okay, we've got nine songs, you sing three, I'll sing three, and you sing three. So in the space of like about a week, we had to come up with, each come up with lyrics for three songs and sing, which we'd never ever done before. I, I remember that rehearsal because I was the first cab off the rank with the vocals. And I thought, well, you know, I'm just gonna have to really go for this or, or it's just gonna be, you know, shit because I can't sing. So I just sort of ripped into this kind of ball. I think that that's how the Psycho's vocal sound began. Um, I'm taking credit for that one. <laughs> I sort of realised that it really wasn't that much of an effort to sing. Gosh, you just <laughs> say a few stupid words and it's done. But it was pretty funny, we were quite unprepared, as, and that sort of maintains right through the history of the band about that, so being so prepared, I think. You know, after that first gig, we sort of sort of got to play at the Prince a fair bit, we did a few at the ballroom, we did started doing a few around the traps, just opening up for other bands, and, and then we did a show one time at the Prince when uh, Mario, who was had Mr Spaceman Records, came up very keen to um, see if we wanted to do a recording. And I'd been given a cassette of a demo tape of custom credit. There's no easy way to explain it other than to say it sounded like 
um, music that was covered in mud. Look, Bill and Peter were pretty driven. They were intent on, they wanted to be in a band because when you're in a band, you get feelers. So they were really driving for it. And I'm thinking, well, I'm in a band because I get free beer. So the more we go for it, we'll get more than four stubbies and we won't have to lug the PA in and out after every, or before every gig and after every gig. So that first recording came about. We did it for 600 bucks. It was just done in a practice room in St Kilda. And when we finally came out with that first EP, we had a record launch, which was built up. It was pretty big on a Wednesday night at the Prince. I got a bit overexcited, had a joint in the dunny with some bloke and drank too many beers and couldn't play. So it was a complete friggin' disaster. The record had just come out and um, Sydney Phantom Records had decided that they wanted 50 or so copies. And so we shipped it up to Sydney and the first thing that they wanted to do was send it straight back because they heard the quality of the record. Of course, it was only recorded in a bedroom. And um, my uh, distributor here, Bruce from Ogogo, was saying, no, 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 you've got to keep it in your shop. Believe me, it'll sell. Within about a week, they asked for another 100. That, that seems to be the case of half the records we were distributing. People would, shops would ring up and go, uh, we've got some folding pressings here. And we're like, no. <laughs> That's what independent records sound like sometimes. And lo and behold, the, the, the bloody thing kind of took off. It, it caught on pretty quickly because it didn't. You could you can draw references to lots of things, but it had a sound of its own that was quite unique, um, and it didn't just catch on. I remember. I was surprised by the number of copies we were shifting into Sydney, um, but then overseas as well. You know, people started to um, write letters to us, fan letters from all these places, you know, the UK, Scotland. Sorry, Scotland is the UK. So England, Scotland, uh, you know, Ireland, uh, and as I said, Scandinavia and, you know, a whole host of these places. Obviously, Europe had a really good rock and roll scene. At that stage, there seemed to be a lot of... Um, government-funded youth clubs, government-funded venues and stuff, and there was a lot of bands touring there from, from America, and for some reason, the Australian edge caught on. I guess if you had a slouch hat with corks hanging off it, you could get over there and there's a fair chance you're gonna get a gig. Let's face it, when the Huddles go to Europe, we're very proud to be Australian, and I'm not talking about, you know, the Australia Day celebrations with all the yobbos going crazy, driving around yelling at Indian cab drivers, not that kind of stuff, but we're very, I mean, you know, we can go to Spain or France and go, what bands do you have? But we've got X, Birthday Party, Cosmic Psychos, Celibate Rifles, Radio Birdman. Should, should I keep on going? The Saints, ACDC, Rose Tattoo, Easy Beats, Masters Apprentices, The Purple Hearts. Should I keep on going? These are the bands we have, and we've got this much people. Right, Belgium? All right, who do you have? You've got all these beers, that's great, right? You've got waffles, but what do you have in the way of rock and roll bands? See, we're really proud to be Australian over there. It's fantastic. And Cosmic Psychos, that's a band you can just pull out and go, this is a great Australian band. In 87, we were, you know, we were planning on touring, doing this tour of Europe, only really having a basic knowledge about what we might be paid or how we would get around or, you know, where would we get the back line from? You know, we just, we really went with our eyes wide open. And then, look at the last minute, Ross said, I'm not going. And we were like, what, you're not going? What, what, what do you mean you're not going? And he had some harebrained excuse for why he wasn't going. I mean, you got to remember that Ross is, is a sort of country boy and, and, he, and he had a lot of very kind of sort of conservative and, and sort of, um, parochial sort of attitudes to things and, and, and the truth of the matter is he, he thought Europe was gay and that the only reason that we wanted to go there was because, you know, we were poofs and all, you know, and all this sort of stuff and not because he was stupid. And he came up with this sort of pathetic reason for why he couldn't go. I just bought a bulldozer with my old man and plus I was going to get engaged at that point in time. 
it was hilarious, you know. It was always something, you know, his old man didn't want him to go or whatever. And, and I was quite sort of devastated because I thought, you know, man, you're in a band, isn't this what you want to do? Like, So we just said, well, you know, fuck it, we, we're going to go. So we asked Al from um, Ben and P to go. And he said, yeah, sure. So we threw some rehearsals together and, and went, you know. But we just stole Ross's fuzz pedal and taught Al the songs, and Al went over as Ross. I sort of did anything and everything in my power not to go in 88, and it was just, I suppose, just disbelief of the whole thing. Whether I was scared of it, I don't know. Don't know, maybe I was at the time. But I just sort of didn't believe we could be going, you know, jumping on a big bird and heading overseas, because that, that was my first overseas trip. And, uh, yeah, the other thought of hanging around with bloody Bill and Dirty for three months, I don't know if that really appealed to me either at the time. Believe me, on that tour, I made sure that, uh, you know, he, that, that he knew exactly what, what we were doing when we were over there, i.e. how much fun we were having, because I didn't want him to miss that the second time. And they were gone about three months, and I just kept working at the hospital in Melbourne that I was in and working on the farm and stuff like that. And I, I think I realised at that stage that I sort of missed a bit of an opportunity. But... You, you know, you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. And the country's his life. Uh, and I love the, you know, I love that about him. You know, Bill and Pete came back and they talked me into it the next year and it was a great time. I just remember a lot of big miles, a lot of overnight drives. It was pretty tiring. And the other thing, we had a sound guy, Michael, with us, and what didn't start off too well, too, I, I'd never been overseas, so I took a big suitcase of clothes. Well, you just end up with a suitcase of dirty clothes. Michael got pissed one night and pissed in it. Well, there was all my clothes gone. We thought it was a toilet. I can't remember how many gigs we did. It would have been 50 or 60 shows or something like that. And, you know, for someone who's used to just putting in a long weekend, like, I'd sort of, you know, party myself inside out by the end of that. Because it's, you know, you're playing seven nights a week. As I said, I annoyed the crap out of him. In fact, I annoyed Peter so much that he left the band when we came back. When he's just about to crack onto someone, I'd walk in between them and start telling stories about snakes or something stupid. <laughs> well, that was fucked from my point of view because he, he'd decide for some reason that he was going to... Um, make life as difficult as possible for everyone, particularly me, so that whenever I fell asleep in the van or anything like that, he'd, he'd wake me up and he was just, just, yeah, he was just an absolute pain in the ass. Pete didn't last long after that tour. He left, he came back, he did a couple of gigs, came back again and then sort of, at the end I had to say, look, now nah, bugger off, Pete. I didn't enjoy, enjoy that tour and I think the kind of, Tensions in the band had gotten pretty high from my point of view. Ross wrote all the songs, but more and more he would come along with the with the the vocals and the music. So more and more it became more of the, the, the sort of Ross Knight show. And the audience kind of started to change. So more and more I I felt sort of not in a kind of an element that I kind of just sort of enjoyed that much. It just got worse and worse from that point of view. They're coming, they're fucked. shoes and they were big shoes completely different styles you know Robbie more of a technical player I'd say Robbie's background I used to see him playing in a band with his brother Rex and Scotty Sticks who used to play the drums with I spit on your gravy and um, in a band called Quivering Quims and Robbie was also playing bass then I spit on your gravy at that time and I remember when we were looking for another guitarist Scotty kept saying to me look mate Give Rocket a go, he's a great guitarist, give him a go. And I'd seen him play, he was amazing. I didn't know if he'd be interested or not. 
So we did a, uh, we organised, Bill and I organised to hook up with him in a rehearsal room in Melbourne. He walked in, plugged his guitar in, the amp blew up, walked back out again, got another amp in, plugged it in, 10 seconds later it blew up, walked back out, got another one in, it blew up, they wouldn't give me any more amps, and he stood there and goes, oh, geez, sorry, mate, I've really fucked up, I rewired my guitar last night, I might have done something wrong. And uh, by the time he pushed the third amp out, I just looked at Bill and said, look, he's in. I actually got the job down the sea, yes. I think they just felt sorry for me and let me tag along, basically, that's about all. All right, that's true. Yeah. It's not far off the truth. Get on your shoulders. Robbie was a great bloke to have in the band because Robbie couldn't give a stuff. You know, he was so easy going. He was a great inclusion for us. You know, he, he, he wouldn't say a bad word about anybody and... Uh, but he was, you know, he was, he was a human dynamo on the guitar. The skills involved with being a uh, cosmic psycho, psycho road crew um, are just zilch, you need nothing. Because the first bike we took to Europe was Digger. He's still with us now. He hasn't got any better from the first trip. And he just wanted to come along because he heard we were playing in a festival with Motorhead and he wanted to see Motorhead. So we sort of turned him into the roadie. And he didn't know really much at all about anything. But he's a good drinking partner and a good mate. So that worked out well. He tagged along. He used to come to gigs and stuff, and he, I think we played a gig at the Melbourne Uni, he stage dived and broke his jaw. I reckon there was fucking 30 seconds of their show remaining, and I did this stage dive. I'm not sure if it landed on the guy's head or his shoulder, but something went crack and didn't feel right after that. I remember I was walking out after the gig and he came up and I signed a poster for him. And I, I looked at him, I thought, this place has got a funny looking head because his jaw was all crooked. And so he finished up in intensive care that night with his jaw wide. Hurt. And then we just got to know each other from there. We used to just dag around, muck about. Guitar tech or roadie, they're, they're, they're the troubleshooters in bands. I mean, yeah, that's the guy that's going to set everything up. That's the guy that's going to have everything tuned up. The drums will be set, the drums will be tuned. Everything's just ready to basically walk on, play, walk off. That's what that's what the, the stage people usually do. You wouldn't really describe some of the roadies, particularly Digger, as as that person. There was no sort of set role. You just help people help them get their gear on stage and get it off afterwards. They are on stage. There might be bloody ten thousand people at a festival, and you're hanging for a drink. It's in the middle of summer. Digger walks past with a tray of beer, and I'm going, mate, I'll have two, better give two to Bill and two to Robbie. And he turns around and says, fuck off, these are mine. I mean, that's the kind of help we've had over the years. Like I played in a band, I knew how to tune a guitar, sometimes pretty ordinarily. I don't know how we managed to recruit these people. I mean, it said a lot about us, really. Yeah. I think it took about two tours to work out that the guy was actually a roadie. I think before that, we thought he was just a friend. Yeah, but you don't need too many qualifications. About the same qualifications you need as a bass player, really. Fuck all. The best way to come across that I came across music of any kind, including Australian music, was word of mouth. Some people go, check out this, check out that. I was really good friends with Mark Arm and Steve Turner, who were in Mudhoney long before they were in Mudhoney. I remember reading a review of the first 12-inch with custom credit on it and, and probably forced exposure and then looking for it and being blown away. Mark from Mudhoney uh, uh, showed me a couple of their, like their first album. The Down on the Farm EP, and then uh, the first album after that. I was turned on to them through Matt, um, maybe some of the other Mud Honey guys. I heard about them from Mark and Steve of Mud Honey. We'd be at the record store, and Steve Turner would be like, you know, have you heard this one? You know, Feed Time Record. Like, no, grab it. Like, have you heard the Cosmic Psychos? I think the Cosmic Psychos were a band that was highly influential on the Seattle so-called grunge scene. I know that Kurt and Nirvana were fans. Um, you know, they played shows with Pearl Jam. They really um, captured, you know, with that fuzz guitar and just the, 
you know, it really had just had this like power that uh, inspired, you know, inspired us. And even though the Cosmic Psychos never really had the kind of commercial impact or success that those bands had, they were still a major influence on them. And I think a lot of it had to do with the spirit and the sound of their music. And they, they'd hang out in Seattle for, you know, like, they get those cheap tickets where they could fly all over the states, you know, for however long. And so they'd, they'd be around a lot, you know, like Ross and, and Matt in particular were very, very tight. So I remember the first time I met Mark Armour properly was he come, we we're doing sound check in Seattle and met him for the first time. And he was standing there while we we're sound checking and he just stands there with a very serious look at his face and he goes, play some of your funny songs. And I'm thinking, we haven't got any funny songs. But obviously it was funny to them. <laughs> funny songs. I'm thinking we were quite serious. Cut some credit. <clears throat> Is that the crawling up the wall? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that, that, that was a big one. <laughs> that, was, that got played over and over and over again in uh, my little crappy apartment. The pub song, though, that's, uh, that's a bit of an anthem, I think. I love it, and I don't even know what go the hack means, and I'm sure I asked him back in the day what go the hack means, but I don't remember, but uh, that song really rocks. Yeah, there's no real read between the lines with them and their lyrics. It's all right there. <laughs> so and the same with the chord changes, and the same with the presentation. I have like, maybe like five frames of the, the greatest record covers ever. In the top three is, is the Cosmic Cycles, and they're standing on the bulldozer. I mean, that's a record you gotta buy, even if you never heard that. The thing about the Cosmic Psychos, and about that era in general, for those of us who lived through it, it was a really celebratory era. It was about partying, and those guys, at least the record we put out, Cover the Hack, they kind of defined that mood and that space better than any slab of vinyl I've heard since. Sopo put out re at one of their records out, and you know we were kind of being spoken about as the you know, the missing link of grunge or wherever it was. And, and I was happy to say, okay, we're, we're the godfathers of grunge, uh, obviously. Because uh, it just sounded like a great uh, way to describe ourselves, even if we weren't, you know. <laughs> there was a thing that happened in the 80s, uh, late, the, the end of the 80s, where the mainstream record labels realized that there was an audience for underground music and alternative music. And uh, there was a kind of a feeding frenzy where the big record labels were all desperate to try to find, you know, the, the next thing that could be monetized. Nirvana got signed, you know, and once that happened, every, you know, everybody jumped, you know, a lot of people jumped to majors. We did. Some parts of it are good, some parts of it you, you lose, you know what I mean? Like you go more, your, your audience gets bigger, but you maybe lose some of your core uh, fans, you know, because they kind of don't want to deal with the crowd or they don't want to, you know. Bill was sort of really pushing, pushing, pushing. Hopefully we could get onto some kind of major. There might have been some money there or something like that. Now, that wouldn't have happened with us because, you know, as I was told at the time, songwrite with someone else, maybe don't swear in your songs. And how about you sing about something a little bit, bit nicer? And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, that'd be real easy to do. We were fucking ugly. And there's no way, I mean, Robbie looked like one of the bloody Marx brothers. Bill was just a bald fucking midget. And I was just this, I was running around with a mullet. Yeah, with a head like a fucking robber's dog. Imagine trying to do me, Bill and Robbie up to, to be marketable. It was impossible. But back in those days, it was just a fun thing to do. Shit, you know, it was better than playing footy. One record with Sub Pop, and uh, and then uh, our, you know, the next record, which I think was Blokes You Can Trust, we we uh, put out through AMRAP, which was more of a spiritual home for us, really, I guess.
Amphetamine Reptile is a record label. And the difference between Amphetamine Reptile and Sub Pop is that Amphetamine Reptile was good. <laughs> Amphetamine Reptile Records, or AMREP, started when I was stationed out in Seattle. Um, at the same time, Sub Pop was, was just a music column in the local weekly reader. Uh, same circles, same type of bands. And then I started, when I was in Seattle, started working with uh, putting out records by the U-Men. And Steve and Mark from Mud Honey, their band Thrown Ups and other things like that. So. I always like pound my fist and go, we put out a Mud Honey song before Sub Pop ever did, motherfuckers, you know. Go back, look at the date, you cocksuckers. Fuck you and your goddamn grunge bullshit. There were several, several big showcases in New York in the prime years of Infinity Reptile. During a new music seminar or the CMJ conference, which were like kind of the South by Southwest of the day. First time I saw the Psychos, I think was in New York City at a big AMREP festival type of thing. It was small, but it was big. The label was doing really well and had a lot of, like, a really good rep at that moment, so it was kind of like the, the moment where we're like, we got the big showcase. And uh, I just remember it started off with everyone loading in for sound check early and cracking open some bottles. And uh, it, it started with uh, everyone changing around. The, everyone had a dressing room. The club was big enough where bands had their own dressing room. The Melvins had like this little broom closet thing and we were sharing one with the cows which wasn't much beer and there was like half a dozen hot beers in there and we were bitching him on and got to tell him about the rider and that kind of stuff and he was just oblivious to all that by that stage. But Helmet, they had a lovely room with lots and lots and lots of food and lots of drink and lots of beer. And they also had a dunny with a long passageway veering off. You'd walk into the band room and there was a glass door, frosty glass door with a long passageway and just a single toilet. The Melvins and the Cosmic Psychos took Helmet's name off of their dressing room door and put it on the toilet door. <laughs> we started demolishing all their goodies. When Helmet all filed in very serious, wearing their three-quarter pants and T-shirts, and saw the Helmet band rooms, so they all single filed into this passageway and got to the end, there was just a dunny in there. So seeing them all trying to come out backwards and turn around, but oh so cool, didn't quite work. So after that, we basically got kicked out of helmets for them, but we ate their chips. And they got kind of upset about that. We all went to the States to record um, Blokes You Can Trust, which was an adventure in itself, you know. I guess at the time, Bill had heard about this Butch Vig, he'd worked with Tad and he was working with Nirvana at the time. This is pre-Nevermind. I'd never heard of him. So we'd organised to go to Smart Studios in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, or is that Wisconsin, Madison? Yeah, Madison, Wisconsin. I thought, you know, at the time, I'll just get in touch with him, you know, I'll ring him up and say, we, we want to come over and uh, have you produce our record. And that's exactly what I did, and he said, no worries. There was a tradition at Smart that when new bands came in, we would usually take them out on the town. Anyway, I, I had something going on, so I remember we loaded their gear in and sort of set everything up, and then we decided to go and have some dinner and, and some drinks. And I bailed early, so I, I got off easy that night. Butch says, well, you won't see much of me. These guys are going to be taking care of everything. Uh, you'll meet them in the morning. And the studio is on East Washington on the Near East Side, and it's a very blue collar part of the city, and there was a bar right across the street, the Friendly Tavern, which actually was not that friendly, but we spent a lot of time there. I think by the time they got to the Crystal Corner, uh, the Jägermeister had come out, and that's a, a particularly delicious slash vile concoction that is, it goes right to your skull. I think they were sort of hoping that if we all shared a bottle, we'd all be crook in bed. Well, many bottles later and many bars later, these blokes would just, I could hardly scratch themselves. I so said, we got in a lot of trouble from their wives and girlfriends. And we got lost because we, we went back to one of their guys' places and after we got booted out, I didn't know where we were. So I slept in a shop front for a while. Bill went some way, Robbie went the other, but we all sort of made it back to the hotel eventually. But we all fronted up for work. It was nine o'clock, we had to be at the studio the next morning. We, all, we were all there ship shape and ready to go. The next day I came in, I had no idea you were there. I walked in and they were just all completely passed out. And 
everybody was so fucked up. Like, the, the, the staff from the studio didn't make it in. Steve didn't make it in. Doug, I think, made it in about four in the afternoon. And he was not a drinker either. And he tried to stay with the Cosmic Psycho. It's like drink for drink, which is a big, big mistake. So Butch ended up doing the recording and the, produ and the production with us. So we're pretty lucky. So we drank ourselves into a good position there. I think we immediately sent out for some beer to get some hair of the dog in your system. And I think I bought a couple cases of beer and then Ross was like, oh, no, 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 no. And I think he bought like 10 cases of beer. And we loaded him into the back of my car and took it back to the studio. I was like, okay, 10 cases of beer on day one. This is gonna be a pretty interesting week. There were always some bands that sort of set the bar high for, for beer drinking in the studio. Killdozer was one. I think at the time they had set a record. At and the Cosmic Psychos beat that in seven days. I don't remember exactly where I was. It was probably getting close to 30 cases of beer. That's a lot of beer. Sort of the rose the occasion. I remember we started recording about 7 p.m. that night, you know, so they, as um, wickedly hung over as they were, they rose the occasion. But Butch was good to work with, really good. And because he, he'd just come from doing the Nevermind sessions, he also, because, you know, we were asking him about it, going, you know, give us a play, so he, he put on he put on a bit of that recording and goes, well, I'm not supposed to play this to anyone, but he just, he whacked a little bit on and um, sounded pretty good. I mean, no one was to know at that stage what was gonna happen to that record, but, but Butch is a great bloke. Look, it was a fantastic experience. You know, Butch created this incredible sound for us. I was surprised, I went down to Melbourne one day and walked into a, you know, a, the usual big record store, Allen's Music or Brashes or something like that, and, and there it was sitting at the front, so. It, you know, in one of them bins, in the new release bins. Well, I hadn't seen any of our stuff in any record shops except for your, your missing links and your go-go's and leading records. So that music was starting to go. The, the, the whole Nirvana thing was building then. The, the Mud Honey were flying in Europe, and just that kind of music scene was just starting to bubble. And I guess it was it was worth a pump to pump anything. And I guess even if we sounded like crap, we had a good name on the on the record cover in Butch Big, so it might have just been his dial on there, who knows? Shows arranged, and there was um, some friends in Germany had arranged to meet this person called Whitney, who said, "I've got a reasonable sized apartment. The guys who can, can camp there if they like." So, so at that time, I was working in film production, and I was doing every imaginable job. I was also a photographer and doing shooting a lot of record covers. Um, so obviously, I wanted to shoot the Cosmic Psychos, my favorite band. So there was a lot of excitement around that. So I got a call like. Can they stay with you? And I was like, "What the hell have I done?" Like I real like I had no idea who these guys were. You know, I mean, they seemed like fun. I loved their music, but I had no, I'd never had anybody stay there that I didn't know. And I get a call from the payphone at the corner, and it was like this crazy kind of crack whore neighborhood at that time. And I see these three guys down there, and Ross was like waving this really cute wave, and I didn't really plan on falling madly in love with, you know, the lead singer um, of my favorite band. I was kind of floored by that, really. I couldn't even remember her name, as I was, because I didn't think I had a show. But uh, yeah, one thing led to another, and obviously I didn't have a show. A show that lasted a lifetime. My, my exposure to New York, I couldn't have got a, had a better guide. I mean, Whitney was great. She's street savvy and and fun, and her her interest in in S and M and all that kind of thing was totally foreign to me. Oh, fucking hell! Oh, no, just wait for the bloody film, will you? Well, in the early '90s, the S and M scene in New York was really deliciously seedy. I remember. Because I'd spend periods of time in New York, and then I'd be away for a while, a long, long-distance relationship, and 
As she got more involved into the scene, I probably got more confused, but still went along to a party one night, went to a, a slave auction where she'd bought me a leather harness. The closest I could get to having him get through the door with a dress code was nipple clamps and a leather cod piece, and I think he was probably still wearing his blundstones. And we get to this slave auction where people are auctioning themselves off for lots of kinky little things, so I just went to the bar and just sort of tried to forget about it and end up talking to a couple of seven-foot trannies. We are talking about footy and baseball and different stuff like that, and then went down to the... Uh, the playroom, as you could uh, call it, and saw some pretty, pretty oddball things. I mean, yeah, for a bloke that was just interested in a good fuck, it was all a little bit different for me, but... It wasn't until I went to the farm that I realised what an incredible difference it was from his experience normally. Since then, I sort of get it now, and it's quite, well, it's quite harmless, really. It's just, it's just a bit of a hobby. It's just letting off steam, so, you know. I said, I, I lift weights and run to let off steam. steam. Some people like getting shoved in boxes and having their balls tied in knots. Well, whatever. But to go to the farm, like, everything was dangerous. It's like poisonous snakes. His mother would garden with a shotgun. And when he was working, he'd say, like, if, if, some, if a car pulls up, come out with a shotgun. Like, are you kidding me? It's like, because they're scoping the place out. Everything was scary for me there. You know, I have no idea, like, what the hell he thought my world was. But she did all right. She wandered around the place and um, used to wear some pretty unreal outfits to the local pub. Uh, so the first time she popped up there was in this micro, mini leopard skin skirt with pumps. I think when she walked in the door, I'd never seen so much beer sprayed out of the top of pots. It was just a little bit too much for things, but no, she got along well. She adapts to any, any situation, so. I'd wanted to direct a video for them for many years, and, I, and it just seemed like the perfect fit. Like, as soon as he wrote Whip Me and sent me, you know, a cassette at that point of it, um, it's like, that's it. Just a lot of fun. I mean, I came home with the biggest bruise on my ass from getting hit with that cricket bat. Kind of summed up their experience, really, like coming to New York. So in a nutshell, it was like, it was Ross's and my story. I think the distance got to us in the end. Communication wasn't great. We had some tough times, really tough times. Um, you know, she's, she's a heart, you know, we broke each other, we're breaking each other's hearts and it just wasn't working out. Like I wasn't willing to give up at that time in my life, this kind of crazy, fabulous thing that I'd made for myself here. But I don't know that it would have been the best for us either. Like, I don't think that I would have been great as a farm wife. And I don't think that he would be great in the city, you know, but it doesn't mean that we, can't still really love each other deeply. You know, we're still best mates. She's one of my favourite people in the world ever. Ever. You know, do anything for her. And I think it's likewise, so, you know, the admiration's still there. We were like noticing L7 posters and Cosmic Psychos posters. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so excited. Like the Cosmic Psychos are days away from us, you know, on this tour. So um, I don't know who left who first the rock and roll love letter. I, 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 uh, I know I wrote on their poster because they were going to be playing a club that we were playing like in a few days. It was like, oh, we love you, you know, blah, 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 like in the dressing room or whatever. Then a sound person or a club person left me a, a cassette, left us a cassette of the Cosmic Psychos covering one of our songs. 
shove at their sound check. And so we, were, we of course, were very excited. And I don't even think we had, we hadn't even met them yet. And uh, I'd put in the line, L7 sluts ain't got no class, changing a few of the words. And they listened to it for the first time and they never met and they turn around and they go, he just called us sluts. And they looked at each other and they go, oh, well, we are, I suppose. Anyway, so it was all pretty cool, it was fine. But we loved it when we heard it, you know, and I've still got, I've still got the tape, you know, so. Yeah, we just got a really good friendship with them. And then we ended up doing some shows with them in the States. They were like our brothers, and we were like their sisters, at least that's how I kind of saw it. The girls come up to the farm here, have a great time, riding motorbikes, having a barbie, playing around with my mate's kids, having a kip on the lounge room floor, just basically hanging out. And we got to stand on the tractor, and I was so excited. It was like, oh my God, this is so wild. Like, I listened to that album so much, and here's the tractor. Real a pleasure to hang out with them, really is. I remember one day L7 come out to the farm, down where he lives, and he's fucking angry ass chicks too. We had him on the motorbike, taking him up the driveway, he's going, fucking dirty monos and that, they're insured. <laughs> I unintentionally lifted the chorus for Lost Cause for an L7 song called Fuel My Fire. And uh, I realized this after <clears throat> The whole band was learning the song, and one of our friends walked by our rehearsal room and said, is that a Cosmic Psycho song? And I was like, no, it's not. It's like, ah, oh, but I didn't want to change it, because it um, it rocked really hard, and I had written like a, a, a different verse and a bridge, you know, and I was just like, oh, man, that, that I, I, I tried to write a better chorus, and I couldn't for that particular tune. So I called up Ross, and I was drunk. Fine rang at 3 o'clock in the morning. It was Danita. And she go, rings up and goes, oh, we've just recorded this song. It's called Fuel My Fire, but it sounds just like Lost Cause. Do you mind if we use it on the record? We really like the song. And I played them the song over the, in the speaker. I was like, I, I, I lifted your chorus, but I, I, I really want to use it. Do you think it would be OK if I used it? And I'll credit you guys and blah, blah, blah. And in the morning, I, I didn't think it sounded like anything. And I go, yeah, 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 whatever. So we got songwriting credits for Lost on that Fuel My Fire, on that album, which was then recorded and covered by The Prodigy. When it was found out that The Prodigy were gonna use that L7 song, I was getting phone calls from everyone saying, oh, you've co-written a song for The Prodigy or something like that. And I'm going, no, we fucking haven't. Like, they were getting no story from me. Two days later, I open up page two of the, the big Herald, Melbourne Herald Sun. Page three, there's a picture of Bill Walsh surrounded by Sheila's holding up a cover of the, one of their CDs with a headline saying, meet rock and roll's newest overnight millionaire. It was the biggest fucking shock I'd ever had in my life. But I remember at the time just thinking, oh, this is this is just hilarious. And at the same time, you know, kind of taking advantage of it as well. You know, something the media want to play up, you know, the biggest band in the world, you know, it's got a connection to this kind of cult Yobbo rock band from Australia. But there's a story there. Uh, so, you know, at the time I'm kind of playing it up, you know, milking it, so to speak. So when I mean, they tried to get a story out of me, I just kept shit counting it. So old Billy fucking went for it. <laughs> and then, you know, that record sold a lot, a lot of copies. So that was, it was all good for everybody, you know? Really hilarious uh, to think that uh, we would have a connection with a, you know, the world's kind of most popular dance band. Who would have thought? for the psychos was, you know, was a lot of driving, a lot of flying, a lot of drinking, a lot of eating, and a lot of playing. 
I, I just reckon that we had more fun than anyone else. The actual playing a gig was sort of like, oh, fuck, we've got to play a gig now. It's a bit, a bit like a holiday. It was like having that Friday evening after work every day. Me and Ross were pretty juvenile, and the little stuff that we used to do to amuse ourselves would have annoyed the shit out of them. We would do things like who could go the longest without changing their socks. So you might have the old 26-day-old socks, people's feet. It was fucking pretty rank. You used to get things bad. They, you know, they used to get hard and stand up. One of, uh, one of the favourite ones, and we used to get lots of people, was Nighty always used to carry one of those little sewing kits that you get. And always, he would sit in the bus, say, or a van or whatever, he would sit at the back. And when people fell asleep or something, he'd stitch them to the seat. So when they wake up, they just go, bruh. We had this stupid night, where were we? Somewhere out east, and uh, I think it was me and Ross and Robbie and maybe Shannon was there, and it was, I mean, God, it was always like eighth grade stupid shit, and it was like, well, let's stay up all night and drink and see who falls asleep first. It was adult men. And uh, <laughs> uh, Robbie fell asleep early on and uh, was laying down on these uh, uh, chairs like this, like three of them, and he was laying face down on it as if it were a bed. And because he had fallen asleep, of course, you're fair game for anything. And for some reason, there was a smoked fish there. And I remember, uh, because he had fallen asleep, uh, Ross was putting a, a smoked fish in his ass. And uh, I just remember Robbie looked up, and he had the nicest look on his face, and he just smiled, because he knew that he had fallen asleep, and in fact, deserved a fish stuck in his ass. And that face is always stuck, because he just looks so pleasant. The Cosmic Psychos are always kind of drunk. That's the best way to describe them. They would seem to be able to just rah, drink beer and then like lay down for like 20 minutes and then wake up in the morning and be, right, hey, let's go do it again. And I'm like, oh man, I can't do it again. I'm gonna party. No, I'm gonna party. I'm just, I'm just taking a Get break. Get his foot. Look at it. It just shows how broken he is. When I was in the Melvins, we played at um, the Nathan Factory in New York. He just happened to be there. And then we were playing and I looked and he was standing in the middle of the stage in front of us, flexing, and he had no pants on. And uh, uh, he had uh, a piercings in his penis and, and there was a beer hanging from it. It was quite startling, but it added quite a bit to the show. It took a lot of the pressure off me. Uh, being on tour with the Psychos is very funny. It's a uh, never ending barrel of laughs and it's also very drunk. And more often than not, drinking games get pulled out. My, one of my favourites involves a 50 cent coin. I'll hand you this and you can tell me what, what memories that brings back to you. Oh, this? Look at that. It's just like this. It's almost the same one I got in my pocket. Look at that. <laughs> what is it like? No, no, that is. Well, that's the, that's the game ball right there. Don't mix them up, this is my game ball. This is the game ball. <laughs> I didn't bring it. I have this with me at all times. You never know <laughs> we use the when corn. the game is about to begin. You know the game. The one you put between your butt cheeks? Oh, yeah, that's the game we play. <laughs> I don't know the name of it to this day. Yeah, there's not much to it. It's a simple game. So you just kind of take a breath, you know, focus. And then you, you um, kind of indulge yourself. Get a good grip on it. It's pretty important. And then there's a walk that you gotta do. And uh, the walk has to be done. It can't be dropped during the walk. Casual, casual, you see? Yeah. Oh, you did it! <laughs> But you made it. Wait, I've never seen it. You break it and it goes in? <laughs> I told you, man, I might break your glass. <laughs> I know, that's all. But working on my glutes lately. Damn, now I'm done. So, the trick is to put it right up your ass <laughs> with the brown socks. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> and then walk over the glass. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and 
Ross, like his interests are so varied, you know, like I can't think of too many people that I know that like have such a weird range of interests, like, you know, the bodybuilding. Here's this guy, he would show up at, at the kitchen, right? I don't even know him that well. He had just come back from, was it Russia or Eastern, the Eastern Bloc with a trophy that he was the oh, strongest yeah. man in the world? <laughs> The secret in being successful in sport is pick an obscure sport for one, design yourself into a weight class where there's not many competitors, and make sure that there's a competition on the other side of the world that no one can get to. That was the first criteria. And then you train really hard, and then you get on the plane, and then you get there, and then you lift, and then you become a world champion and then you scarper out of there and you don't tell anyone about it, there was no one else there. Well, I've always sort of aimlessly lifted weights and think it was gonna help me football and turn me into a great footballer. Didn't work. And then uh, took an interest in powerlifting. Thought at that time it was gonna help with me uh, oldest boy as well. And it sort of, it was a, a place to, a good place to be. I met Ross in Austin Shed, which was in Bendigo, and uh, he said, oh, we've got a new guy that wants to come along and have a lift, and I didn't know Ross, and probably would have been about 15 years ago, and uh, Ross came in, and Ross being Ross, within one night, everyone really liked the guy, and they said, okay, well, um, he can lift with us, you know, because we didn't want anyone there that we really didn't like or rubbed us up the wrong way. No one really paid to lift there, and it was just a, uh, a club for the boys, and. Um, Ross probably become the most popular guy, as he is now, still the most popular guy. Everyone loves Ross and it's just his nature. And uh, everyone wants to be Ross. <laughs> and he's bloody strong as well. Geez, he can lift some weights. He's unbelievable. He pulled up phenomenal weights when we went overseas. I saw him deadlift 277 and a half kilos. And um, he was only weighing about 90 kilos and just pure strength. I've been lucky enough to uh lift in St. Petersburg and win a world championship there in powerlifting in my age and weight division. And uh, I won another world championship in Atlanta. But he's broken a lot of records. He's very, very, very strong. The whole thing's really about lifting for me and me, me oldest boy. That's, that's been my drive. My oldest son, Jika, is, um, he'll be 16 this year and he's got uh, cerebral palsy quadriplegic cerebral palsy, I think is the official thing. And he just had a pretty crook birth. He's, he's at his battles. He's the strongest bloke in the world. He doesn't get around on his own a lot and he's grown a lot. And he's a bit of a handful. He's, uh, you know, you've got to be an expert at UFC, wrestling, boxing, acting, and nutball. So you've got to be tough in all the right places to, to um, pick him up and handle him. But uh, yeah, he's, he's a bit of physical work. So you now the weight, the weight training has, has always been my goal. Someone's going to have to pick him up. Someone's going to have to carry him. So it's, it's all coming back to roost now. I'm getting older, he's getting bigger. So I've got to stay stronger. And uh, eventually he might have to carry me around. What, what he can't do, I'll do for him. As long as he's there beside me. Last time I was down there, I was doing some kind of solo gigs, so we were playing theatres and Ross brought the two kids down and um, just to see him as a dad on his own with the two kids, you know, it was pretty special. Yeah. You know, you have, you have one side of him that's all this stuff that we're talking about, but then there's this whole another deal, which actually makes what we're talking about even more uh, intense because there's a lot to deal with there. Beautiful, beautiful relationship that he has with his son. One of the best album covers and one of the worst album covers. Like <laughs> yeah. self-totaled being an amazing Great. cover. Yeah. 
and pa- Evan. Palomino pizza. <laughs> 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 well, Palomino Pizza was a bit of a rushed effort. The name was wrong, the cover was wrong. <laughs> oh, he's, I think I really offended Bill when he showed He's like, oh, I made it a new record. And I'm like, what the fucking hell is this cover? What does yeah, that even mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Palomino Pizza, what the fuck? That's yeah, a Spinal Tap esque. <laughs> it got to the point where it was like, ah, oh, who cares? You know, it's done. Who cares? From there, from that disappointment, it wasn't that long till we went in to do um, self total in with Lindsay at Birdland. Instantly more comfortable, pretty relaxed. You can hang so much shit on Lindsay and he'd just chuck it back at you. Every record that um, we've done was pretty much done uh, the same way. Like, you know, wasting a lot of time drinking and then whilst we're drunk, trying to play catch up. By the end of it, I, I just always had the same feeling, like, how the fuck did we do that? I don't know if it was the Cosmic Cycles or somebody with the Cosmic Cycles that said, you know how the Cosmic Cycles have a record called Blokes You Can Trust? They go, well, the on News are like the Cosmic Cycles Junior, except they're blokes you can't trust. <laughs> That, to me, they're a cl- classic Australian uh, underground rock band, uh, similar to Cosmic Psychos, X, uh, The Meanies, these bands that actually can just go anywhere in the world and just blow people's heads right off. Yeah, well, the only is we sort of hooked up with them. We'd sort of hooked up with them a long time ago, and a few other people had told me about the Onyus. Then we started playing a few gigs with them, and we got on like a house fire with them because they were probably even mis- more disorganised than what the psychos were. So we just sort of said, do you want to come to Europe? I don't know how they did it, but anyway, they made it. So they came to Europe with us a few times and oh, we had a blast with them. Oh, it was unreal, totally unreal. You know, I mean, you're used to playing in Brisbane to five people 98% of the time, unless there's some market day or something where you get a crowd that doesn't like you anyway, and then you go, you fly over to Europe and you go to the underground club in Cologne and it's packed and they're actually liking what you're doing. Back is with his law degree. He's a, uh, what is he, solicitor or barrister or some bloody thing, but yeah, so, yeah, Mac is a lawyer. So that would made it even stranger. Uh, one night, it was the Cup Eve, it would have been 97. I was standing out the front of the high fi bar in uh, Melbourne. Robbie was there and he said to me, oh, look, I'm not going to the States tomorrow. I'm going catching the train home. You'll be going. And I, I didn't have any idea what he was talking about. You know, Bill and I are waiting at the airport and there's no rocket. You know, we, next thing, we're sitting in New York. There's still no rocket. No one knew where he was. And, of course, we were more concerned that he'd fallen off his perch or something horrible had happened to him. I went back to Brisbane and... Then I was coaching swimming out of Wynnum and I had a phone call at the pool deck. Can you go to New York tomorrow morning? And uh, I did. <laughs> it was weird. It was weird for me because then, you know, you watch, first of all, you're watching your heroes. Then you're going on tour with your heroes. And then you're playing with your heroes. I mean, the first gig we did, I mean, Ross goes, yeah, this is John, he's been in the band for 17 hours, and um, now we're gonna play some songs. And like, literally, I knew, I told him I knew five, I got on stage and I knew three. But we played about four or five songs in that gig. I actually had to play the bloody guitar properly, or attempt to, you know, because you're filling in for someone who's pretty bloody good. The Psychos, towards the end of the 90s, turn of the millennium or whatever you called it, we weren't really doing much. Bill was at his involvement in the Cherry Bar in Melbourne and Robbie was battling his, his demons at the time. 
and just couldn't get anyone motivated. You know, I'd drive all the way down, yeah, we'll go and practice at a cherry bar, but so we, I'd drive all the way to Melbourne, Robbie wouldn't turn up and Bill was too busy to practice and everyone had something else to do and I wanted to keep playing. I had a heap of songs and I was really keen on doing another album and another CD, whatever you call them nowadays. I got in contact with, um, with Dean, who I'd met a couple of times. I didn't really know that well, but I'd met him a, a few times to know that he was a bloody great drummer and a, and a really good bloke. You know, and I didn't really get it, you know. I just thought they were bogans, dangerous, dangerous bogans, you know, the, the sort of guys that would, you know, knife you on the train. So at the time, I didn't like them at all. I thought they were terrible. Another guy that I'd met years ago, uh, Kieran, and then sort of said, do you want to have a, a bit of a jam? Yeah, we formed... We formed Dung. It was just really good fun playing with those blokes. Things are sort of starting to get a bit, you know, they're getting a bit strained, I'd say. We always got along well. I mean, you know, I used to run the, run the show over in Europe. You, you, you like driving the bus and just getting things happening. And I suppose without that sort of competitive edge to Bill, that never would have happened. Because, I mean, you're going to get fuck all out of me. I, I really didn't know. You know, Bill was connected with all the right people, so he, he got a lot of things happening for the band. But, uh, yeah, Bill's business sense, uh, well, it left, left a lot to be desired, we just might say for now. The last couple of years, tours and stuff, there was a lot of things not adding up. Everything was being, all of a sudden, sort of this, uh, our open policy about open, everything, everything got real secretive and, uh, I don't give a flying fuck about the money. It was just, it was a trust issue. I don't know, there were, look, there were questions about the finances uh, at the time and, and look, I was quite gobsmacked by it. Um, but I, and I got my back up and I, at the time, and I just thought, well, um, I'm just not gonna talk about this. And as I kept saying to Bill, you know, let's work it out, just, let's just, clean the slate off, get it over and done with. We'd had a lot of good times together. You know, and I sort of imagined I'd be playing in the band with Bill into our 70s. But, you know, as I said, three strikes. Kept bringing it up, kept getting swept away. And in the end of the day, Robbie and I just went, nah, fuck it, fuck it, you know. So we decided to head off without him, which was, um, you know, we were quite happy with the decision at the end of the day. You know, hindsight's a great thing. You know, in terms of uh, our relationship, I think we both agree and sort of have subsequently that we probably should have sorted them out then and there, but we didn't. And, um, you know, the rest is sort of history. It wasn't a sad decision. Frustrating. I was fucking angry about it for a long time. But, you know, like everything, the older you get, you don't worry about that kind of shit later on, because it really was. It was only talking about dollars and cents. But it was, it was a trust issue. You, know, you don't do that to your mate. And when Bill got booted out, and Dean knew nothing about Bill getting kicked out, and I asked Dean if he'd want to join the psychos, so. I said, bloody oath. Of course I want to do it. You'd be crazy not to. The strength of G uh, Dean's uh, drumming is uh, 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 Bill's uh, weakness. You know, the, this all is technically better drumming because he knows how to use his wrists better and stuff like that. He doesn't run out of puff, for example. So Dean technically knows exactly what he's doing. So it's a genius drummer selection. It freshened the band up to the point was, for me, it was great because you had fucking numb nuts here on the bass and I had Robbie on guitar and Dean on drums, who's a fucking amazing drummer. And it just made, again, took my two chord riffs, the same song played backwards for 30 years, sounding even better. It was great, you know? I mean, geez, I didn't even drink um, for 10 years before I joined the Psychos. And, uh, you know, look at me now. <laughs> Champion. A few years later, we're all settled, you know, Dean works, he's got a family, I work, I've got a family, Robbie's got a family. So it was sort of, everything was running pretty smooth, really smooth. Like, couldn't have been better, I reckon, at that point. Couldn't have been better, it was just so easy. And all of a sudden, we realised that we could sort of get around without following Bill. You know, it was usually, yeah, righto, Bill, whatever, and just follow him around and he could organise everything. Well, somehow, we managed to do it ourselves. It wasn't that fucking hard. It was just a matter of doing it. We didn't have any management stuff, I suppose, Dean's, Wife Kim helped arrange a few things for us. 
quite a lot actually, because I don't know how to work a computer. But between Dean and, uh, and Kim and that sort of, you know, if we wanted to do something, they'd be able to arrange it and do it. So it was, it was fucking great. <laughs> First track on the album of Off Your Crew at Kill Bill. It's quite self-explanatory, really. It's um, it's just all about how I really like the uh, Kill Bill 1 and 2, those films. They're really, really good and really violent. There's lots of hate in there and lots of killing and murder and action. So it's just all about those films. It's fantastic. Fantastic. Love them. My favourite movie. You said what? I First I was like, oh, you prick. And then I thought, that's kind of funny. You know, I just thought, oh, well, you know, it's always nice to have a song written about you. <laughs> Songs like that, still, you still, every time you sing them, you get a little bit out. You get a bit of shit off your liver. So, yeah, it's good. It's a closing of a book and just moving on, really. It's that last, you don't have to go and punch anyone in the nose. You just sing a horrible song about them. And, hangs around forever. Not that the song's not about the movies. Of course. Chase some batteries. Oh, oh, Robbie, it's good to see you. Oh, yes, I couldn't agree less. Oh, there you are. How are you? Why have you been? It was under the table. No, I'll tell you, I was looking for a bloody pack of chewy. Pack of chewy? Yeah. You got, you've been gone an hour. I'll tell you what, I still didn't find one either after all that time. Very disgusting. Mine for two bucks. Oh, you got some? Oh, 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 oh. Hey. Yeah, I'm Robbie had, had a, uh, he'd had a heroin addiction for, since he was a kid, like, you know, since he was very young, I suppose, and I guess I wasn't aware of how bad it was at times. You, you tend to turn away from that. You tend to, um, I never criticised him for it. It seemed to be in control. He never bugged anyone. You could, you could lend him money, you'd always get it back. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't a, a sneaky about it. It was just, you know, we, we all do things we shouldn't do. And uh, for, for Rocket, that was just something that he, he loved doing. And he told us that. He said, you know, this is what I really like doing. So he never criticised for it. And, Everybody has something, don't they? Everybody, we are human beings, particularly people like him who are just in all aspects of their life, incredible, just one big problem. It just seems to be the way. Yeah, you know, the happiest, funniest guy in the world, he just needed that support. So, you know, if we we're gonna go out or Robbie was wanted to go back to the room or something or back to the hotel, well, one of us would go back with him. We just stuck with him, stuck with him the whole time because, you know, we were thinking that, you know, maybe one day this will all, we'll all come out the other side. Well, the last gig in Bendigo was, it, it was a significant gig. It was, it was just a, 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 a really good gig because Robbie had had this old Marshall box that had been stuffed for years and uh, we got it fixed up for him. And he came up on the train, there was a series of, Odd text messages coming from the train, so you knew he was. You knew he was on, and he turned up, and he was all over the shop. It was pretty funny, and then he, he couldn't find his kettle cord for the back of his amp. So Rocket and I went blasting up the street to um, Safeway, and then to Kmart. You know the gigs coming up. It's coming up. I'm still looking for kettle cords. Then we started hitting restaurants, running in saying, "Can we have a kettle cord? We'll pay you ten bucks for a kettle cord." So we eventually found one, and played the gig, and it was. Yeah, I wasn't drinking that night because I was, I was a designated driver and we were just sitting out the back of the ute after that show. He, everything happened that show. He, he, you know, there was the usual, the drums fucked up or something, so Robbie entertained the crowd by playing Zorba the Greek with his teeth and it was just a really good, fun thing. And the feeling of the band at that time was awesome because Off Your Crew, it was, we're really happy with that. 
15 had just settled really in and just the three of us were flying, absolutely flying. And Robbie was going to stay with me that night, uh, but he'd left his bag at Dean's, so he just went back, went back there. And we were chatting away and I told him then, he was the first to know that um, my partner at the time, Kate and I were expecting little Gage, expecting another kid. And we were just, yeah, it was one of those times where it's 3.30 in the morning, you're leaning on the ute, having a great old yarn, just a really good yarn. And he was stroking his box and just thanking us for what we'd done and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, and that was it. That was it. Got the phone call the next day. I come back, come back to the farm. I got the phone call in the morning and by the time I got there, you know, there was nothing, nothing I could do. Nothing anyone could do. Yeah, not a, I don't know how his family and and everyone coped, but you couldn't imagine. But for us, it was it was devastating because you know it's, it's another family, and then you start thinking what you could have done to prevent. You can't help but thinking that's preventable, but in reality, it's not. It's it's just up to that person. I think it's just up to the individual to get it out. There's nothing that anyone can do. They're going to make the decision. And, so you go through that guilt thing, what if, what if if I'd picked his bag up, what if he hadn't have gone there, what if, what if he uh, hadn't have scored when he got off the train in Bendigo, what happens if he hadn't have scored in Melbourne, what if, what if, what if, you know, but at the end of the day, that's, it's like saying, you know, it's like the Tats Lotto numbers, you just never know, never know. But it was a shit time, a shit time. There's something that you thought could happen, but you never thought would happen. So, when it did, it was like, ah, oh, no. It wasn't like, oh, fuck, that's coming out of the blue. It was like, oh, no. It was more like, ah, oh, it was just sad. That's, yeah, it was just sad. Yeah, well, Robbie's gone, but he's um, sitting in a hole not far from the farm, really. It's about half an hour from here, so what I do occasionally, not as much as what I used to, but bi-monthly, I suppose, I'll go over to Rocket's graveside, I'll take a ride on the motorbike, pick up a few stubbies of beer, stick one about where his mouth would be. Cooper's red, sparkling ale is his beer. It always has been, and every time I'd be running him back from then he'd go to Castle Maine, we'd always call into the bottle shop and I'd buy him a long neck of Cooper's sparkling ale. And every time we'd open it and he'd have a sip and he'd say, thanks for saving me life. So that's the one, that's his brew of choice. I've played the footy for him when Richmond versus Essendon occasionally, and, but basically just to go and hang out there and have a quiet time. It's just a place to sit down and if it's a nice day, I'll just lie down in the sun, just have a bit of a reminisce, but just to say good day. Talk a bit of crap, really. We nearly, we really were going to chuck it in. Because it's very hard to go on without someone like that. I, I hope that people will, because of this, will realise how bloody good that guy was. It, yeah, it took a while to wonder what to do. You know, life without the Rocket Man was, was seemed impossible. It's still weird, but um, yeah, it just felt like he just had to get back on the horse. But then, uh, I think it was Narelle stepped up. But his wife Narelle said he would have wanted you to keep going. So you know, Ross said, "All right, well, who do we get?" And thought about it for a day, and he rang me up and said, "Well, I'm going to ask Macca." Well, Macca was the only person that could have ever. Could have ever, could ever, I played, it wasn't him, it was no one. Yeah, we all love Macca. And he's a, he's another unique personality and someone we can all get along with. So it was just worked out fine. 
get out of it. So, piss off. Yeah, so there's only one in my mind, and that was Maker. Glorious Bastards, I think there was a lot of that stuff was, a lot of the riffs I wrote not long after Robbie died and stuff like that, and it was just getting, yeah, getting that period cleaned right out and settling in with Macca, and it was just there, just establishing the new house, you know, just building on that, and, you know, it just, you know, for me it was a, it come up as a pretty good, pretty good foundation for the next 30 friggin' years, or whatever it's gonna be, as long as we stay breathing, so. Yeah, every, every album's got a bit of a period, it's whatever happens in your life at the time, sort of thing. It, you know, if I wasn't getting along well with the ex, you can sort of tell, as you can go back a few albums in the last 10 years that haven't been really happy. A bit of frustration creeping in there, but Glorious Bastards is not all bad because nice day to go to the pub, well, that's, that's about the happiest song you could ever write. It's the stupidest song, but it's the happiest song. It's, that's meant to put a smile on people's faces, and away we go. knows what's going to be in the next album. Quite a lot, I'd say. I've got quite a bit of shit on me liver at the moment. Ross's Farm it clearly has a, a key role in, you know, practically every aspect of the Cosmic Psychos. You know, as our chief songwriter, a lot of, you know, our songs were about the farm. But no, this is me. This is what I do. And I'm quite happy with that. Pig and shit, really. If Ross was ever to lose the farm, I think it'd be devastating. You know, the farm defines him in in, in many ways and defines what he what he is and, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but, you know, it defines him as a person. So it would be a tremendous loss. Yeah, the farm's a big deal. Being able to go down on the farm and hang out with Ross, if he lost that or had to sell that. It'll work out, uh, hopefully. Uh. What's going on? Uh, it's a day before I go to court for me um, wonderful settlement, financial settlement. So I may not be a farmer for very much longer. Just put everything's been on old music wise, just about. Just my heart's not in it. I can't. I can't get up there and pretend to be happy and hang shit on myself if I'm not. Christ, this is only about friggin' a stupid relationship gone sour. There's a lot more important things happening in the world. Well, if I'm in any state of mind to do anything, I've got my first Olympic weightlifting competition Saturday and it's, it's like going from, uh, I don't know, I'm going from powerlifting to Olympic lifting. So I guess that's a bit like leaving primary school as a triple-A student going to university where they only speak French. Same weight, 75 kilo. Third attempt for Ross Knight. Daddy, see Ross is a famous musician, heavy metal band. I'm afraid I'm not an expert in that area, but he apparently has great renown throughout the world. We welcome him to his first weightlifting competition. It just so happens that uh, the Cosmic Psychos are going to be in town 
uh, over the next three nights playing some uh, very, well, increasingly rare shows. So with that in mind, and uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dean and Ross from the Cosmic Sarcos. Welcome to you both. Good, yeah, thanks very much, Steve and Harry. <laughs> Greetings, viewers. <laughs> now, uh, it's, it's been about 18 months since uh, the Psychos have played, and uh, are you looking forward to getting back into it? <laughs> Yes, with a serious frown. <laughs> no, it's definitely time to get a bit of shit off the liver, Stu. Yeah, so you're yes, getting so well. So be back with uh, not so much a vengeance, but back with venom. Can we expect a bit of kick? There's going to be shit flying off my liver left, right, and centre. So wear your safety glasses. You're staying in town for the weekend. Is, is it one of these guest appearance weekends where uh, you don't leave till Monday morning? No, I'm driving down and I'm driving back home every night. Oh, right. So, uh, Why on earth would you do that? Well, I've mm. got me boys. I've got little athletics to get to on Saturday morning and I've got to take my other bloke swimming and, Christ, I've got stuff to do. <laughs> Friday at the Tote sold out with the Dukes of Deliciousness. Saturday at the Tote sold out with Bits of Shit and there are a handful of tickets available. Why are you th- yelling, Stu? That's well, what I do. Explaining this song to my five year old son and his teacher at parent teacher interviews. has trouble concentrating at school and he's been caught swearing. Oh, that's really bad, I say. I want a great big rubber nose. I want to get around in pantyhose. Yes, Gage distracts other students. I say, oh, that's really bad. Parent-teacher interviews, who would have fucking thought? But who would have thought at 50, I'd still be at the fucking tote with me shirt off. So there you go. I want long, golden locks! I want a great big 20-inch cock! But there's something not quite right. Do you want me just for my money? Or do you want me for my lead break, honey? (laughs) 